What, what are the protests about now? Is this about education, uh, economic disparities? Is this about uh, Mike Brown? Yeah. I would say ultimately I'm an ally of the children that we serve at Teach for America St. Louis and so all of those children gr are growing up in low income communities. Most of them are children of color or first generation Americans and so we know that systemic injustices much more disproportionately affect them. So inadequate education, inadequate housing, inadequate employment um, and difficulties with policing and distrust in communities highly affects them and so me being out there is really to support them and their voices and make sure that they're heard. Um, and I would say ultimately right there was a, a cause that brought us all out here but we recognize that all of those injustices that I just talked about are deeply interconnected and that we have to pay attention to all of them right so we have to um, pay special attention to how we police our communities and how we make everyone feel safe including our children including our children of color but we also have to look at the the things that have been happening in our communities for decades centuries even to make sure that we're solving long-term problems as well so what is the goal when a group of protesters march through a mall on Black Friday? Well, I, I would say it, it's to ensure that apathy doesn't take over this movement, right? That we actually recognize what President Obama said yesterday in response to Eric Garner's uh, death and the failure to indict the officer that choked him to death, um, that this is an American problem. If everyone doesn't have access to the American dream, then we're not living up to our ideals. If none of if one of us is not free, we're, none of us are free, right? Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so bringing that conversation to everyone is what these young leaders and protesters have been wanting to do. You know, I think I, I agree that you know, housing, education, feeling secure, being able to raise your family in a safe and, you know, uh, environment where you make some money and all that, those are all great goals. I think that uh, the question you have, Casey, though, what does walking through a mall, how does that enhance it? That's a good question. And at some point, you know, things are going to turn if they haven't already. You might make more enemies than you get followers if it goes on ad nauseum. Last week, Senator John Danforth said, okay, what can we do? How do we turn this into strategy so that if you do have concerns about the level of minority participation in police departments or if it's housing or if it's education, let's sit down and figure out what exactly we have to do to make that happen so the world's a better place for everybody as opposed to slowing business down, hurting profits and revenues, which ends up in layoffs, people out of work, people can't get to their jobs, people might go out of business as some of them have in Ferguson already. Well, we could have said the same thing about those, those Greensboro college students who sat at that Woolworths counter, right? That they slowed business down, that they disrupted things, mm -hmm. but it was necessary to address those injustices. And we actually were just able to uh, see a special screening of the film Selma that will be coming out about that um, legendary Bloody Sunday, that march on the Ed Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, in Selma, Alabama. And one of the things that really struck me about that was that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King went to the White House. He worked on strategy. He made sure that there was a, a policy angle to this thing to make systemic change. But he also went back out into the streets to make sure that people did not forget the injustices that they were protesting. I, I can see uh, protesting a lunch counter if that lunch counter is segregated. It, you absolutely target that business. But many of the businesses targeted, in fact, many of them in Ferguson that were burned down, for example, are owned by, by minorities. Many of these businesses have nothing to do with injustices whatsoever. In fact, they're employing people who are of color. They're owned by people who are of color. And I'm just not sure it's really productive to the cause. I think we have to be careful to remember that the vast majority of the protests over the last 119 days have been completely peaceful. But do you worry that most people might not see it that way? If you're, if you're doing something that disrupts their lives, if you're now... Uh, kind of in their backyard, so to speak, and, and, and they also have seen the images on TV of things burning. That might seem like the very same thing to a lot of people. Do you worry about that? Of course we worry about it, but I think that's the reason why conversations like these are so important, to make sure that the truth is visible to everyone um, and that we recognize that when a couple of bad things happen, that does not actually color an entire movement. Um, during one of the mall shutdowns on Black Friday, I actually got to hear from a store owner who had to close his doors, and he said, you know what, this is America, and if I have to close my doors for 15 minutes for you to express your First Amendment rights, I'm okay with that. You know, I'd have to agree with you about uh, you can't color it all this is the entire movement and it's the same way in policing is we've all of a sudden leapt to uh, one of the state senators tweeted last night has the KKK 
infiltrated American policing. I don't know if you got to see that out there, from one Missouri State Senator. Now, why, what would make her think that? What would make her think that that's the case? Because of these two cases? So there's 800,000 police officers in this country, and there's two very, very uh, focal points right now uh, with the New York case and the, and the Ferguson case. That's not how policing is done every day in America. But everybody's being painted with this broad brush right and now I, I, I in, think, in the police world. And I think the protesters are doing that. I mean, I saw them in Clayton yelling the N-word at African-American police officers mm -hmm. as they protected the Buzz Westfall Justice Center. No protesters were telling them to stop it. And apparently at Hazelwood East, the, the students were doing the same thing with the F-word, the N-word, taking on police officers uh, and, and labeling all the police officers if they were all guilty of some sort of crime. So I would be very careful, right, that if we're not going to paint police officers with one broad brush, and I would agree that we should not, we should also not say they, right, and the protesters' language is very important. I'm seeing them. I'm and seeing I also, it. And I am as well. But I also think that we have to recognize that in this moment, there is a lot of pent-up frustration that has been happening for decades, right? For people's entire lifetimes, they've been dealing with these injustices. And so sometimes that can bubble over in ways that we might not, not always like, but are very real. So I think what is incumbent upon us is to not just talk about how we calm the current vitriol down, but how we actually get to the root causes that are making people this angry. We can talk about stopping people from saying certain things on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, but we really need to be talking about how we change things for years. I, I, think, I think I mentioned that. Let's, mm -hmm. let's get the piece of paper out and let's and I think you're doing that with the <coughs> Ferguson Commission Sorry. let's have a strategy what do we want to do what's our goal how do we get there shutting down some guy's business in Ferguson on West Florida and South Florida I don't think that gets us there you, you, you also need uh, I would argue or I would ask broad public support for for major uh, systemic changes let's look at a, the, the Business Journal had a, a poll I think it's worth noting out, uh, pointing out not scientific but I believe the Business Journal asked uh, people's opinion on the grand jury decision. 71% uh, of these are business journal readers uh, say that they got it right. I know the protesters don't feel that way. Do people that you talk to feel that way? Chief? Well, you know, in every police officer out there working today, which my son is a 23 year old young police officer, are questioning their decision to enter law enforcement as a career now because of this. Uh, they have basically said, you know what, maybe it's better I just answer my radio calls and go to home every night instead of doing proactive police work. How many police officers today do you think would be willing to approach four individuals at the back of a closed business at two in the morning and say, what are you doing back here? Because it could turn ugly. And they would be the next Darren Wilson. That's every police officer's biggest fear out there is they don't want to be the next Darren Wilson. One way to make sure that doesn't happen is stop doing policing. And we've seen that in this country. I saw it personally in Cincinnati when I did their CALEA accreditation ins inspection. Uh, I went to Cincinnati. I talked to the federal monitor. I talked to the police officers. I did ride-alongs and over the Rhine in Cincinnati. And they said after the federal government came in and took over the police department, we stopped doing police work. And crime went up by huge margins. Now, since it's gone back down, like most of the country, most crime has gone back down. I predict we're just starting to see the beginning of this is you're going to see crime increase in the urban areas in particular in this country from here on out. It's not going to stop for a while. Well, I don't think that it has to be an either or, right? And I know that law enforcement and community members and on the Ferguson Commission, we've already been talking about how to really engage in community policing. Um, I, I understand the poll and I understand people's opinions, but there are some statistical facts that popular opinion can't change. And so we know that between 2010 and 2012, um, when you compare 15 to 19 year old black youths and white youths, um, almost two in uh, one million are killed by police officers if you're white, and it's almost 32 if you're black. But is it and because so the African American individuals are suspects of crimes? Is that why? Is that why the number is higher? You can't just say they're targeting African Americans. Well, if if I could finish my point, right? There are there are there are also uh, is research that shows us um, that there is uh, it, um, excuse me. Uh, unconscious bias is the word that I'm trying to use. Unconscious bias um, on the behalf of 
everyone, right? And that when you talk about uh, putting people and giving people the level of responsibility where they are carrying a gun in a community, then there is a high standard that those folks should be held to, right? And so if we see those disproportionalities occurring, then we have a responsibility to investigate that I and to hold people accountable. That, 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 that's high standards for sure. We've, we've also seen statistics, too, where the, uh, the white population in a particular community commits more crimes, mm -hmm. even though the, the, the black community may be stopped more, more frequently. That, and that's not, and, and, and not just here. I know USA Today did some work across but, the country. But let's Precisely. get real. In St. Louis, homicide, for example, I mean, that's a crime that is largely committed by young African-American males. And, you know, as a police officer dealing with that, it's very difficult. How many police officers, Chief, have been shot at since August the 8th well, in, in, in St. Louis? Since Michael Brown uh, died, there's been five law enforcement officers within eight miles of Ferguson that have been shot. Not shot at. Yeah. We're not counting those. I mean, that's the reality we're dealing with right now. But and they, and what, to what extent does that ruin life's prospects for the young African American in oh, St. Absolutely. Louis? Absolutely, I would agree with you. But there is a foundation to those problems that have to go back to those systemic injustices no that I started with. When we look at ed, uh, unequal education, when we look at unequal employment, there is a reason why people are going and making some unfortunate choices because of that lack. Well, and so we have to pay attention to long term well, systemic why is solutions that the police fault, in order. Though? I didn't say it was no, the police No, I'm just saying fault. that the police are getting the blame for most of this problem right now. Sure. Pretty much, this started way before Mike Brown. Way before Mike well, Brown. Well, I, I would say that talking to several of my friends, several of the students that I serve, several of the young people that I've had the privilege to get to know over these last 119 days, that the problem people are really identifying, and sometimes they might not have the words to articulate, but the problem people are really identifying is a culture of distrust that people really do want to see healed. And so the question is, again, how do we get after those long-term solutions so that systemic injustice doesn't bring us to this point once again? Will the Ferguson Commission be able to do that? I've actually heard from protesters who feel like the Ferguson Commission on which you said is just to make them be quiet. It's just to placate them. Well, do you, are you confident in the, in the in the authority or the power the Ferguson Commission may have? You know, I really believe in the people involved. I believe in Rich McClure. I believe in Starsky Wilson. I believe in so many of the diverse people that we have from all walks of life that have come together um, in order to try to make real sustainable change. But we need the community in order to make that happen. We can't move forward on anything unless the community says, this is what I want to see worked on, and these are the kinds of solutions that I have in mind. And so we're still continuing to work out the process. We're still refining things so that we can listen intently uh, and so that we can make long-term choices uh, and recognize recommendations to this state to move forward. Back to where we kind of started the conversation, you need the community. To, can, will, will you have the community if the protests continue? I mean, I think that's about doing the everyday work of having tough conversations like we've just been having, right? And so operating with a lot of honesty and operating with transparency and also operating with care for people, right? We're all just people trying to trying to live in an equal and just society. Is, is there a gap? I'm sorry, Chief. Is, Charlie, I'm just thinking of the people you talk to on a daily basis on the radio. Is there, is, how wide is the gap between what the protesters uh, want in the purest form and what people might be taking from the message. Well, I'm not exactly sure exactly what the protesters want. I'm not sure that's clear yet because the terms are, you know, pretty broad. I think even as you mentioned, Brittany, we're still kind of listening at, at this stage. But uh, I think there's a big gulf to answer your question between people who I hear from. I mean, from all sides, both sides, up and down, black and white. Uh, I think that. Mm, I think St. Louis is, is far apart on a lot of these issues right now. Are we worse than we were on August the 8th? Are, are we more divided I, now? I think so. And, and I'll say, I, I, I think uh, it's a bad situation. I think that right now you're going to find people aren't going to come here for a college. People aren't going to move businesses here. People aren't going to accept transfers here. I think that a lot of people in North County will be moving to St. Charles. Or is the other Harrison. way to look at this well, that we have the chance to lead the nation on a problem that any city would be I foolish think, to think they don't have? I think we have to look at it with that level of opportunity, right? I think there's a question as to whether or not we are more divided today or if we were always perhaps this divided and this actually just brought certain latent things to the surface. But we have to look at this with eyes of hope and with uh, the view of an opportunity to say we can lead the nation, we can have the tough conversations, we can heal that rift so that we can come together law enforcement and community members to actually create a safer, better place for our children to live and learn. I, we we, 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 we want to uh, wrap in just a second on this particular conversation, but I would be remiss if I didn't say, I mean, any other time, I, we might do a whole show that you just met the president this week. Can you, mm. can you give us your impressions? I mean, it was an incredible privilege to go and represent our children, right? When we talk about 
low-income children of color, not a lot of people ask how they're doing and what they need. And so that was the responsibility that I feel like I walked in there with. That was actually the 59th anniversary of Rosa Parks being arrested sitting down on that bus. And so thinking about my ancestors, thinking about the people, the freedom fighters that came before us, and thinking about the children that have been looking up to me saying, am I next? Um, and I just want to learn. I just want to be great. Making sure that I relayed that message to the president was of, of uh, primary importance to me. So it was a, an incredible opportunity, but it was certainly one with a lot of responsibility.